We're very fortunate tonight to have all of the candidates who are running for Congress uh, for the 11th district seat. And uh, we're going to have each of them have two minutes for their opening statements. And then if anyone does have any questions, I ask that they go ahead and send those up this way. Uh, we'll start with um, Bob Barr. Thank you, Rebecca. And thank you all for being here this evening. And thank you so much for the Cables for once again performing such a tremendous public service of opening their home, their farm, and their resources to further the debates uh, and public education uh, for important public offices. My name is Bob Barr. I met many of you, including our law enforcement officers here, several years ago when I had the honor of serving as President's Reagan, President Reagan's United States Attorney. I also had the honor of working with many of you during those years that I was honored to serve in the old 7th District as a representative in the Congress of the United States. Now, folks, there are six candidates up here for the United States Congress in the 11th District, and we've heard from a number of other candidates for public office, and we'll hear from a number of candidates also following our presentation who are running for the United States Senate. Now, one of the candidates here, now one of the public officials here this evening is the enemy. The enemies are in Washington. Yeah. They are Harry Reid. They are Nancy Pelosi. They are Barack Obama. They are Eric Holder. Those are the enemy, and that is where we need to keep our focus. As a former member of Congress who has served for eight years up there fighting President Clinton, impeaching him, fighting against the liberals, balancing the budget, cutting taxes, the one thing that differentiates me from these other fine candidates is not the fact that I can say I'm conservative. We can all say that. We can all say it truthfully. It is not that I can say this group supports me, that group supports me, and some other group supports me. That's not what differentiates me. What differentiates me is I have been there on your behalf. I have fought the liberals. I have defeated them. We balanced the budget. We cut taxes. We reformed welfare. We protected our Second Amendment rights. It can be done. I ask for your help. Send Bob Barr to Washington to complete the job that we started years ago, and that is to defeat the liberals. Thank you. Thank you. We next go to Alan Levine, Mr. Levine. Thank you for attending this meeting, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Alan Levine, running for the 11th District House of Representatives, and I approve my message. <laughs> <laughs> the reason that I'm running is that Washington has gone insane. I've been naturalized American citizen since 1975 until the year 2000. This country was doing very, very well financially. After the turn of the century, I found that the country was starting to fail. It's failing because we are borrowing so much money in Washington from uh, China and having the Federal Reserve uh, create phantom money that I suspect, and I strongly believe in fact, that in 2018 or 2019, unless we do something about it, seriously actually resolve these problems, in just four years, uh, the dollar will fail. If it fails, we will have a catastrophe. Now, rather than talk to you about we need to do this and that and whatever, I have concrete solutions. I have, and if you visit my website at alanlivingcongress.com, you'll find that I've written 200 articles on positions. No other candidate talks about what they want to do and exactly how they want to do it. They have pictures of their families smiling and with big donation buttons because running for Congress is expensive, but none of them have real detailed solutions I have done. I have three big things that I want to do. I want to eliminate federal corporate taxes. I only have 30 seconds. The reason is we will become the number one global tax haven, and trillions of dollars will flow to this country, creating millions of new jobs for Americans. Uh, number two, I want to uh, create an effective term limits amendment, but I'm, I'm out of time. We can talk about it later on, but please visit Alan Levine for Congress, and once again, I approve my message. Thank you. Thank you. Ed Lindsay. Thank you all, and I want to echo the thank you all for y'all being here tonight. My name is Ed Lindsay, and I want you to vote for Congress. I'm working real hard in Cherokee County. We've got great grassroots support, starting with Sheriff Roger Garrison. Roger, where are you? I don't know where you are, but Sheriff Garrison's out here. He's endorsed me. Your uh, state representative, Mandy Ballinger, has endorsed me. Why have they endorsed me? Because I am a Georgia conservative who gets the job done. I've proven that on the state level. 
I've gone after the balanced budget amendment. I got that passed in terms of calling for a balanced budget amendment on the federal level. I've gone after Obamacare and passed what's called the Lindsay Amendment this year that goes after Obamacare. I've gone after illegal immigration. I was a co-sponsor in HB 87 and got that through the Georgia House of Representatives in 2011. One of the toughest illegal immigration laws in the country. I'm a strong advocate of school choice. I was a co-sponsor of the Constitutional Amendment calling for school choice here in Georgia. And I chaired the organization that was that that led the fight for that school choice amendment, and we were the first state in the country, first state in the country, to pass a school choice amendment, and I led that fight. I've led the fight against Medicaid fraud, and the bill that I passed in 2007, and I updated it this year, has brought back to the state of Georgia almost $160 million from folks that defrauded our Medicaid system. I've gone after open government by demanding greater ethics reform. I've gone after protecting the least among us by, by passing one of the toughest anti-human trafficking bills in the country. I'm a Georgia conservative who gets the job done, and this is how I do it. I have the, the patience to listen, the strength to lead, the wisdom to know how to compromise without to negotiate without compromising my principles, and last but not least, the strength to and the courage to stay the course when time to get tough. All right, thank, thank you. you. All right, our next candidate is Gary Loudermill. Good evening, I want to thank everyone for being out here today. I had some prepared remarks, but I just want to talk to you. This is the most critical election in the history of our nation. Shortly after I announced I was running for Congress, which wasn't an easy decision because we have a very close family. I was speaking at a high school baccalaureate service, and the pastor was going to introduce me. He came up to me and said, Barry, I know that you're not here campaigning for Congress, but let me ask you one question. In one sentence, tell me why you're running for Congress. I simply pointed where my kids were sitting. I said, because they deserve better than the government we're passing on to them. Travis, raise your hand back there. Travis is my oldest son. In, a, in about three weeks from now, his wife is due with our first grandchild. That grandchild deserves an America that I had growing up, and we're not passing it on to them. That's the only reason I'm running for Congress. Now, you've got a critical decision to make. Who will go and stand for those principles and those values that we hold so dear in America? You know, growing up here in Georgia, my parents instilled within me some values that we pass on to our children. And those values are simple. Put God first in everything you do. Serve others before you serve yourself. And standing for what is right isn't always easy, but it is always the right thing to do. As I took the advice of my dad who said never complain, if there's something you don't like, do something about it. I took uh, my experience as a husband, a father, uh, an employer, an employee, and a United States Air Force veteran to the state capitol where I consistently, consistently stood on those values of faith, family, and freedom. Because of that consistent stance, I have been endorsed by most every major conservative organization in this nation, including Senate Conservatives Fund who named me the number two candidate in this nation, simply because I have the courage and I still have the courage to stand for those principles that made America great. God bless you. I need your vote. May 20th, Barry Loudermill. Thank, Thank you. you. Next, we have Larry Morinsky. Neighbors, it's good to see you. Every two to four to six years, you get disappointed. You look and you say, what did we do in the last election? Ladies and gentlemen, the era of the career politicians is over on May 20th. I have not voted to raise your utility bills. I have not stood and said I'm for term limits when you can't find them on the literature since August 17th when I announced everything that I have said and done as I've done in my career. I stand before you to make change. This is our time. This is when we can finally say career politicians climbing the ladder. It's my turn. I'm next. Fingerprints, oh yes, character has fingerprints. And ladies and gentlemen, 
I didn't bring up $10,000 of your tax money to go ahead and make something and then make you pay for it. Tax enough already, we can smile about it, but it's your money. Ladies and gentlemen, vote on May 20. Vote for change. Vote not for the career politician, but somebody from Cherokee County to be your second congressman in the history of this county and for this district. Ladies and gentlemen, let's believe again. Let's bring back America. And for the veterans, how many veterans in here? Ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to fix it. I've been there and I've done it. And for Adolf Putin, I've sat across the table from the Russians. I know how to fix this. When the times are coming ahead, you want somebody there with a steady hand that knows it, ladies and gentlemen, I'll do it for you. And I will not accept congressional pay. Ask them if they'll pledge for that. Follow the money, ladies and gentlemen. Look forward to being next time from ColonelIron.com. God bless you all. Thank you. And now we have Trisha Pridemore. It is an honor to be with you all this evening. Thank you for uh, making time out of your week to come out and learn about the candidates for all of the races that are going to be on your May 20th ballot. My name is Trisha Pridemore. I'm a third generation small business owner, and I'm running for Congress so that we all together can preserve this American dream. My granddaddy had an eighth grade education. My father was the very first person in his family to graduate from high school. I was the first person in our family to graduate with a four-year college degree. That is only possible in the United States of America. There is no other country where you can rise up and do whatever it is that you want to do and accomplish great things. However, we have a federal government that consistently is standing in our way. The size, the scope, the breadth of the government reaches into our small businesses, reaches into our families. And I think that it's time that we, as citizens, as Americans, rise up, take back our government, make sure that we can pass that American dream on, not only to our children, but also to our grandchildren. I humbly ask for your vote. I humbly ask for your support in this May 20th election. And don't forget, early voting starts next week. Thank you. That concludes the, um, the opening statements. We're now going to have a couple of questions from the audience. Uh, the first one, uh, and we'll start uh, with uh, Mr. Barr, is will you accept congressional retirement? Will I accept? Yeah, I mean, it's, uh, they, there, there's a lot of misinformation out about there about congressional retirement. I mean, congressional retirement is something that as a member of Congress you pay into, like federal employees and per and private sector employees into retirement programs. I mean, sure, I think any candidate gets up and says, I don't know whether I misunderstood, but one of the candidates said that he wouldn't accept congressional pay. Sometimes he says he wouldn't uh, accept congressional pension. You know, these are just, this is just political talk, political nonsense. Uh, the fact of the matter is what's important is some, sending somebody to Washington that doesn't have these silly sound bites, that actually has a proven record of having voted for balanced budget that has that actually achieved a balanced budget as we did in 1997 that actually voted and worked and accomplished cutting taxes these are the things that are important this is what we ought to be focusing not sound bites about congressional pay or congressional pensions thank you the same question to mr allen levine the answer is yes. I think you need to uh, check out with each candidate and see who's been already working for the federal government in one uh, capacity or another and is already accepting a, a large pension. I go one better. Uh, people want a term limits amendment. Uh, it's very unlikely for a term limits amendment to pass. It will take years and in the meantime, a foreign country will stop loaning us money. We need to clear out Washington the way to do it, along with the uh, pension fee is if they don't resign in eight years, the pensions are lost, they're avoided. Uh, uh, candidates to the um, representatives and senators will quit to keep their pensions. Eight years of representatives for, for senators and then they have to be gone. Thank you. Thank you. The same question to Mr. Ed Lindsay. The, the problem with the pension system isn't that that congressmen receive it is that they get a better deal than just about any other government employee. 
and I do very strongly believe that we need to fix uh, the pension system for congressmen uh, so that uh, we don't, as a congressman, get any better benefit than the remainder of the federal employees. I also believe in term limits. I believe in a 12-year term limit. Two terms for the, for the U.S. Senator and, and six terms for a congressman. That's plenty enough time to get up there, focus on what you need to get done, get it done, and go home. Now, that's how I think that we, could, we ought to be dealing with this issue. Thank you very much. Thank you. Same question to Mr. Barry Loudermill. Well, that's a, it's interesting. I was asked the other day about congressional pay, and I paused. Uh, when the uh, reporter asked me about it, and they said, you paused, I said, yeah, because I just found out how much congressmen made. I had no idea. I had not even looked into what the pay is. I don't even have an idea what the pension system is, because that's not what I'm running. I mean, if this is the, the, the most pressing issue that we're going to talk about this campaign, we have an $18 trillion debt that is a national security issue. I mean, when you look at the rights that we're losing every day, our children deserve a better future. That's why I'm running for Congress. As far as the pension system, in any pension system, if you pay into it, you ought to be able to get your money back. I'm sure uh, the colonel here retired from the military. I'm sure he's got a military pension that, that he's living on. I mean, I have nothing against pensions, but it should be equitable. It should be fair. But we have so many pressing issues in this nation today that must be addressed first. Thank you. Well, unlike uh, those folks up here, in the military, we do certification and education. And I think my education, not that I put it, my father didn't have a high school degree, outstrips those who will still not answer the question, will you serve me without taking the pay? Now, we've heard some disingenuous. Ladies and gentlemen, 17%, 69 out of 463, make $100,000 a year. 57,641 is the average retirement for a congressman. They still will not answer the question. A congressman, ladies and gentlemen, it's a service. Maybe six months. Maybe they come home. But as far as my pay goes, tell that to Mickey over here, a line of duty looking for a kidney. This veteran over here served this nation. But we're going to take congressional pay. Ladies and gentlemen, we are in debt. And the spending starts with me. Is it an issue? I'm telling you that it starts with me. You're going to save. I want to serve. I don't want the congressional pay. Answer the question. Thank you. The question now goes to uh, Trisha Pridemore. Trisha. Yes, I'll take congressional pension. But as your congressman, I'll work seven days a week, 24 hours a day to earn it. All right, this is the last question. It's a long one. Um, Everyone talks all the time about what they want to do about our $17 trillion deficit, but what about our $100 trillion unfunded mandate? We'll start with, start with Bob Barr. The, uh, the, if you go to the website for the National Debt Clock, uh, you, it almost uh, makes you dizzy watching the numbers that go round and round and keep increasing. It never goes down, it keeps going up. And it's uh, approaching $17.6 trillion and change right now. Uh, that really is simply the tip of the debt iceberg. Uh, the unfunded mandates, which push the total figure of money that the federal government, that we the taxpayers, are liable for well over 100, and by some estimates, 200 trillion dollars. Uh, you attack you attack that the same way you go after the 17.6 trillion trillion dollar debt. You simply start. You can't go ahead of that and all of a sudden start attacking the other. The question is kind of silly. It's all debt. And what we need to do is what we did when I served in the House on your behalf previously, and that is to stop a rogue president. Uh, in his tracks by not passing a single one of his spending bills, force him to the negotiating table until we can get rid of him in January 2017 Thank at you. the latest. Thank you, Bob. Next to Alan, Alan Levine. I happen to uh, do some research on this and wrote some notes. We have to grow our GDP. Everybody else talks about cutting the budget, nickel and diving to try and reduce entitlements. It would never happen or just be extremely difficult to happen. We must increase our GDP. If we uh, end federal corporate taxes, we'll see trillions of dollars coming here from foreign 
uh, countries that will want to invest in the United States and provide millions and millions of jobs. A statistic that I just found in my 15 seconds is that by 2030, all government income, which is currently about 18.1% of the GDP, which is a historical norm, will go to entitlements, and there won't be any money, discretionary money left. In uh, one of those areas is SSDI, Social Security Disability Insurance. The total population of the foreign of these states will be uh, dependent on government checks. Everybody, Nebraska, West Virginia, Idaho. Thank you. That is your time limit there. And we'll turn the question over to Ed Lindsay. Well, let me tell you something that you know often do, which is both of the two, two people who just talked have a point. They're both right. We have to do two things. Number one, we have to return a balanced budget. The best way to do that is through a balanced budget amendment. That's why this year, as part of my duties in the Georgia House, I co-sponsored the bill calling for a constitutional convention to demand a balanced budget amendment. If Congress won't do it, then the states must do it. We must take that initiative. That's number one. Number two, we must grow our economy. That's the only way that we're ever going to ultimately pay off this debt. We've got to take care of that, those corporate taxes that are way too high compared to other nations so that we can return the trillions of dollars that are offshore. We need to do other things. We need to reduce the size and scope of the federal government. We need to take care of regulations, reduce those as well, so that we can stimulate the private sector. If you want to take care of those unfunded mandates, it's got to be done through growth through the private sector. It can't simply be done by the federal government. Matter of fact, that is a anchor, not, uh, not, a, not a drive for us. So Thank that's what you. we need to be doing. Thank you. All right. Question goes now to Gary Lowermill. Again, this is one of the most pressing issues that we're facing in this nation. We all talked about at the end of this fiscal year, we're going to have an $18 trillion debt. That's just from Congress's deficit spending. Let me give you an idea how much that is. If you were to go back to the birth of Christ, and every 60 seconds put away $16,000, every minute since the birth of Christ, you still wouldn't have $18 trillion today. When we look at the unfunded mandates, we're somewhere between $60 and $100 trillion. The only way that we're going to fix this problem is one, improve the economy by reducing government regulation, get government out of our lives, get government out of our pocket, get government out of our businesses and let the businesses create the jobs that need to be created too. We must curtail Congress's inability to balance its own budget through a constitutional amendment to balance the budget. We have to give some transition time, balance it by the year 2030, and then force Congress into cutting its spending and with any surplus pay off the debt. That's the only way that we're going to do this and also through tax reform, through things such as the simple tax, which will actually put into place private measures for uh, our retirement, Social Security, and Medicaid. Medicare. Thank you. All right, the question now goes to Larry Marlinski. August 17th, I asked them, also put into uh, the website, haven't changed. We haven't had an energy policy discussion since 2008. Energy is the bedrock key. No more increasing the debt ceiling. We need to stop that. We haven't heard that. That's what we need to do. And by the way, when we talk about it, it's convention of states. It's not constitutional. It's convention of states that Georgia legislator, legislature discussed. So we have to know not only the terms, but we have to know the pathway. Ladies and gentlemen, we have to use the fair tax. Fair tax is the only one that has a package that does away with the 16th Amendment. 73 supporters in the House and 10 in the Senate. And I'm telling you, that is the only one that has the support. Don't look at rhetoric in a campaign year to minimize it. We need to do the fair tax. And spending starts with me. No retirement. Thank you. Now to Trisha Pridemore. Unfunded mandates are only part of the problem. With $17 trillion in debt, it's time for us to take away that never-ending checkbook that we've given to the White House. I would start first with 61% of the federal budget that's made up of social services programs. Of those, you've got Medicare, Medicaid, Social Security that operate about between a 30 and 42% operational costs. Here in the state of Georgia for 20 months, I served Governor Nathan Deal as Executive Director of the Governor's Office of Workforce Development. My job was to go in and roll back an, an oversized uh, state agency and be able to bring it back in line to where we can actually operate and do our, our real mission, which was to put people back to work. During that time, 
Uh, we were very fortunate and very blessed uh, to not only be able to work hard, but put together a great plan. And we realized nearly 100,000 people that came off the unemployment rolls. We put them back into work, got them skills that they needed, and uh, really made a difference for the state. That's what I'll do for you in Congress. Let's get the 11th District.